Amen. It's good to see y'all today. Amen. It's good to be in the house. Amen. Even if it's raining outside, thank y'all for braving the rain and getting here today. You know, it's, it's so awesome. Um, I want to uh, just say a few things as we get into the word. Um, when I was, uh, I'm going to take you kind of a, uh, y'all, y'all know how I do sometimes. I, I want to get here like two feet away, but I'm going to take you a mile and a half to get to it. So I, I'm going to do that a little bit today, but I want to tie some things together that you have. Why are you laughing, Anthony? Why are you laughing at me like that, okay? Now, and so I want to I do this, but I, I, I really feel like God has a real prophetic message for you today. And uh, I've taught this uh, a couple of times, but um, I felt like God would not release me from this word till I brought it to this campus, okay? And so I, I wanted to, when I got saved, I, I, w- I jumped in head, head first. I went in, I just, when I, when I got born again, I just, I, I was glad to be born again. I knew what, now I had tasted what the other life was like, I, I was done with the other one. And the first thing I did is I felt a, comp- a compulsion to just dive into the Word of God. Maybe you remember that time when you got saved. You was like, oh, my God, I got to read the Bible. I'm going to read the Bible. And I got addicted to reading the Word. I absorbed all this information, just taking all this information in. And, and y'all, y'all remember that time? Yeah, getting all that information, reading the Word. I mean, I, I couldn't get enough of the Word. I'd wake up reading the Word, go to bed reading the Word. During the day, I, I would take the Word, the Bible with me to work, and read it on my lunch break, and everybody was calling me Jesus freak and all this stuff. And, and, you know, and I did get offended, but I was like, that's the goal, you know? And, and so I, I dove in head first to, to the Word, and I started getting information. Say information. And, and I, from that, I, I got these, these two things I want to share with you. Uh, number one, I got this, it's the immutability of the word. That's a big, that's a big word, isn't it? Immutability means that it's unchanging over time. It's unable to be changed. The word of God is unable to be changed. Do you understand this? I remember growing up in school, and you, you, you've probably seen this where uh, the, the textbook, you were especially science and things of that nature, would say a, a, have a different edition number. Well, this is the third edition. This is the fifth edition. You, you'd see that because school books are full of facts, and facts are subject to change with information. The difference is that with the Word of God, it is a truth, and the truth cannot be changed. If the truth can be changed, it wasn't the truth in the first place. The Word of God is where we measure all facts next to. If you put a fact next to the truth and your fact doesn't line up, your tradition doesn't line up, your your false teaching doesn't line up with the Word, you've got to go with the Word because it is immutable. Amen? Amen. So the second thing I learned is that it's the infallibility of the Word. Why is it immutable? Because it's infallible. It means it cannot, it's unable to be wrong. If you are a born-again believer, you have to believe. And this is something that, that, that as I read the Word, I read the Word with a little bit of skepticism, thinking, well, it can't all be right. But what I learned from reading from Genesis all the way through to maps, I found that, that man didn't write this. They penned it as God spoke it. They were historians, and they were, they, they were scribes. They were anointed to write down the things that uh, anointed men and women were saying, and it became the scriptures that we have today because those things were important to God. Amen? And so it's the infallibility of the word and the immutability of the word. Matter of fact, today's proverb in verse thir- chapter of Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. Even though I read the word, it took me a while when I experienced something in my life and I would apply the word to this thing in my life, I would find that the word was truth. Amen? You know, and if you, if you were born again not reading the Word, let me encourage you to start by reading the Word. Pick up your Bible and start to read it. And here's what happens. Like, well, I can't, I can't, I don't, I pick it up and, and I don't understand it. Well, you know, there's probably a lot of things you don't understand until you dive into it. Yeah, and, and the Holy Spirit is assigned as part of His job as a teacher to teach you what you're reading, help you to understand what you're reading and get it into your spirit. Amen? Amen. The word is spirit food, okay? And so we want you to read the word. We want you to get it. So the first thing I got was information. Say information. And let me just tell you some things about what the word says about itself. I'm just going to run over a few little things, okay? Number one, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word. When did the word come in? The beginning. He says, and the word was God. So God holds this word equal to himself. What he says, he holds equal to himself. His character is revealed in his word, and his word reveals his character. 
and the Word was God. I, I discovered this. I heard people say, well, the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. And I was like, I ain't heard nothing from God. But the more I read the Word, I found I didn't have to hear a voice. I've already, I'm, I'm reading what He's already said. And so I, I started seeing these things and getting this experience, you know, just by being in the Word. And there were times I would read the Word and I was like, man, that is just don't make no sense to me. And you know what, but I kept reading until an understanding came. Amen? So John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Psalms 119 verse 5, uh, pardon me. In Psalms 119 9 it says, How can a young person keep their way pure? And it says, By reading the Word of God. We try to socially pound purity into young people, but if we put the Word of God in front of them and let them read the Word, purity will come. Amen? Amen. The Word is not something you just get into. The Word is something when you get it, you don't depart from it. Amen. So, same chapter, Psalms 19, 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden your Word deep in my heart that I may not sin against you, O Lord. So the more Word I get inside, the, the more I am, I, am less, I am less likely to sin with more Word in my life. I'm actually going to think two or three times about what I'm about to do or say next because the Word is in my heart. Amen? And so it, Psalms 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. In other words, you may be in unfamiliar territory sometime in your life, but with the Word of God, it lights the way you're supposed to go. Amen? You know what? When I became a Christian, you know what? That was, an un, that was a, a new place for me to walk. I'd been in church, but I'd not been a Christian. I was walking in a territory different from my, my social upbringing uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a, 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 an adult beverage drinker. As a, a, somebody who, who uh, liked the ladies, as somebody who, who did everything socially, that, 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 was, that was my religion. So, society was my religion. Everything society did and said, I just repeated and, and did it. But when I came into the Word of God and I started reading, I start, and I was like, I'm stumbling over this Christianity stuff. But as the more Word I got, the more the path to walk it was lit up in front of me. It was unfamiliar territory to talk about purity, to talk about being set free, and to about that when, when people started using words like salvation and righteousness, I was like, whoa, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but the more you read it, the more you and the more you get around it, the more you start to understand it. Amen. Don't worry about what you don't understand now. Dive in. Actually, the book of Revelation says that that the more you read the word, even what you read with Without, un without understanding, you're still blessed because you read it. God will light your way through the Word of God. And I started reading the Word for, for that information. And then I came across the thing that God wanted to do next in me. And that was not just read the Word for information. He wanted me, pardon me, He wanted me to have revelation of the Word. Amen? Say Revelation. Because, see, sometimes you read things and think, oh, well, that's a good, that's good information. But then you read it and God gives you some insight into it. You just got revelation on how to make it applicable in your Christian walk. He says this in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. All scripture, say all. So you could be reading Levitical law and get something out of it. Okay, you can read the book of Numbers. Have y'all ever tried to read Numbers? Yeah, I have read it. Because it was part of the Bible. I have read it and go, I cannot get through this too soon. But I'm just, I'm just being honest. But the more I read it, I was like, I saw the value and impact it had. Amen? He says, all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. Say profitable. I told Amy, I said, I'm going to start measuring everything I do as a Christian leader, as a minister, by how much impact it has. I don't want to do stuff just to do it. I want to do stuff that leaves, that leaves an impact. Amen? He says, every, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Knowing how to, how to dissect the Word and put it into your life. Doctrine. For reproof, for correction. Does anybody ever need some correction? 
Let, let me see those hands high. Come on, don't, don't, don't leave them lay down. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all need that correction. And, and it comes from the Word. The thing is, we, yeah, but I saw both hands. Two people, and, and lifting feet. I saw you. That's awesome. And, you know, a lot of us, we, though we know we need correction, we don't always receive it if it's given in the wrong way. But when you read the Word, you can get spanked and not know you got spanked. You can be corrected and not know you just got corrected. Amen? I wish my dad would have known how to do that. My dad believed in impact uh, correction. <laughs> and so he says it's for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Man, when I started reading the Word, I would get all this information and God started teaching me how to get revelation out of the Word. Hey, and then, so, so say information. Say revelation. And so as I started reading the Word even more, I ran across this scripture, okay? James chapter 1, verse 22 23, 24, and 25. So I'm, I, I, I felt like I was doing good getting all this information. I felt like I was doing getting a little bit of revelation out of the Word. And then he says this in verse 22. Listen. He says, but don't just listen to God's Word. You must what? Say it. Say it. Do. Do the Word. He says you... But don't just listen to God's Word. Don't just read God's Word. Do the Word. Now, my, my responsibility to the Word has, of God has gone to another level. It's one thing to read it. It's one thing to get a little revelation to it. Now I have to apply these things into my life. He says, pray, so now i got to pray. He says, believe, now i got to learn how to believe. He says, he says, don't bear false witness. Don't, don't be a liar. Now I have to quit telling lies. I have to tell people the truth even if it hurts their feelings. <laughs> I'm going to stop it right there, okay? I ain't going any further, okay? He says, he goes on to say in verse 23, he said, he said, for if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing into a mirror. Have we done that today? We looked in the mirror today? Okay. So we looked in the mirror. He said, and you see yourself, and you walk away forgetting what you just saw. You just looked in the mirror. See, the Word of God is that mirror. Now, when I look in the mirror, um, I'm, I'm, if I see my hair out of place, I'm going to have to fix my hair. If I feel like I need shave, I need shave. But I, I don't know this until I look into the mirror, or my human mirror right here tells me. Trim those ears. <laughs> there should be just one, there should be two eyebrows, not one brow. <laughs> Guys, that's a lesson for y'all. I give you that for free, okay? He says, you, you see yourself, you walk away forgetting what you just saw. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, the word, that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So he said he'll bless us for reading it, though we don't understand it. We, the blessing is we'll start to understand. He says if we start doing, he will bless us in doing the word of God, even if we fall short sometimes. Because I remember thinking, i got to be a doer of the word. And I tried to do the word. And I'd fail it, and I thought, oh, my God, I messed it up already. But I was in practice. I'm practicing righteousness. And in, in practice, what happens when you practice? That's where you make your mistakes. He didn't say if you practice and mess up, you're done. He said keep practicing. Because keep pra you know how I know I'm practicing? Because when I mess up, I say, God, forgive me. I, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do because I remember what I, exactly what I read. And when I didn't do it right, I go to God and say, God, I really messed that up. Please forgive me. And you know what he says? Okay. He's not going to hold this against you. What you repent from, he doesn't hold against you. Never. Amen? Amen. That's good information. So, I'm going to stop right there. I want to take you somewhere else that has nothing to do with what we just said. I want to take you to a whole other place 
But don't forget what we just said, because what I'm going to do, this is, this is me, Anthony, taking you, you know, we're going five inches away, but we're going to take a mile to get there, okay? I want to take you somewhere else, and then I'm going to tie the two together. Can I do that? Okay, let's go to Leviticus chapter 24. Leviticus 24, okay? And I, want, I just want to read these very careful things here. Uh, it's, it's four verses. Leviticus, Leviticus 24, verses 1 through 4. Are you there yet? Leviticus 24, verse 1 says, The Lord said to Moses, Command the people. Now, when he says this, this means the church. So you've got to listen very carefully what I'm about to read. Okay? He says, Command the people of Israel, of the church, to bring you pure oil. Say pure oil. Say pressed oil. Say olive oil. So listen to these things he says in verse 2. Command the people of Israel to bring pure oil of pressed olives for the light. Say the light. Then he says to keep the lamps burning how often? Continually. Now there is a lot of instruction in that one scripture. Let me read the rest of them to you, okay? Verse 3. This is the lampstand that stands in the tabernacle in front of. Say in front of you got to pay attention because all this is important. In front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron must keep the lamp. And when he says Aaron, he means the priestly order. You are kings and priests. Amen? In this New Testament. He says Aaron must keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence all night long. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed for, from generation to generation. This thing, even though it was spoken in Leviticus, there is a light in our life we are to keep burning. Matthew chapter 5, in almost the beginning of the Beatitudes, he said, You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Jesus said, As long as I'm in this world, I am the light of the world. Look, when he left, he left the light burning inside of us. We just got to know how to make the light keep burning and burn it brighter. Amen? Okay, this is where you're supposed to say amen. Say amen. amen. That was good practice for the next time, okay? Aaron and the priest must tend the lamps of pure gold. Lamps and say pure gold. Continually in the Lord's presence. Okay, so let me tell you before we move on what olive oil, one of the symbols of olive oil is this. It is the symbol of purity and of the presence of, and the influence of the Holy Ghost. Let me say this again. Oil symbolizes purity, presence of God, and the influence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now, let me just, before we say this and go on, I want you to notice that we, I asked you to repeat something in this scripture. He says in verse 3, this is the lampstand or the lamp that stands in the tabernacle in front of the inner curtain. So the inner curtain housed... The Ark of the Covenant. This is where Aaron's rod was. This is where a jar of manna was inside of this. This was what God set his, his principles upon, his promises on. This is what this was our identif our eye identified this. When we saw this, this identified the promises of God to us. But that was on the other side of the curtain. The lampstand stands in front of the curtain. Now that may not mean something to you now, but it will in a minute. This thing, this lampstand we just read about that has to have oil, a certain type of oil, and has to be taken care of 24 hours a day, stands in front of the, is separated from the presence of God. Okay? Now, have y'all got that? Say yes. Okay. So I want you to go to now to Matthew 25. Don't worry. I'm going to tie this together. Don't look worried. Matthew 25, I love Matthew 25. This has been a place the Lord has not let me leave for about the last almost month. And, and the, the chapter 24 and 25 are, are something that stir inside of Amy and I. We, we find ourselves wanting to read other things. I'll read other things and come right back to this. Because there is something in, this, in these two chapters that God is really trying to get to the church right now. Amen? And so I believe what we're going to tie with those things. We talked about the Word, the infallibility, the immutability of the Word. We, talked, we went to a different place and talked about the lamp and the lampstand. And now we're going to read chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Okay, are y'all ready? Matthew 25. And, and let me just say this. This is, this is within like two, 
days. Jesus spoke from chapter 21 to the time he was taken to the cross. Okay? Or till the time he was taken in the garden. He spoke chapter 21 through chapter 25, 26, all this within like two days. So all these prophetic words he had to get out of his spirit. There were people writing these things down to get them to us today. And in chapter 21, we, saw, we just celebrated the Resurrection Sunday, what we call Easter. And we saw it, the beginning of chapter 21, Jesus comes riding tr- on a donkey into the city, which is a prophetic word of Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says that he will come in humbly and lowly riding on a donkey, okay? And when he came in, the people were singing songs, and they recognized something was about to happen. And they, they, they started putting down their coats and where the donkey would walk. And he would not have to touch his feet on the ground. And they would put down palm branches, swallow by call it uh, Palm Sunday. What, what, I, I think that's why we call it Palm Sunday. Yeah? Some of us kind of running together right now. And so they, they would put this and Jesus came into the city and it was this triumphant entry. Do you know where he went after that? He went into the church and started flipping tables. Jesus was running people out of the church. I'm trying to keep people in. Jesus was getting ready to leave the earth and he's running people out of the church. If you Just, just a thought before we read this. You go to Revelation chapters 2 and 3, maybe even verse 4, chapter 4. You see where Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. When he was leaving, he dealt with the church. On his way back, he's dealing with the church first. What we're about to read is Jesus dealing with the church. 1 Peter 4, 17 says that judgment does not begin with the sinner. Judgment begins in the house of God and with God's chosen people. So if you are under the dealings of the Lord right now, or if, or if you're not, guess, get ready. God loves you enough not to leave you where you are. Amen. Amen. Okay. So let's go back to Matthew 25 for the third time. I'm actually going to read it this time, okay? Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Say foolish. And five were wise. Say wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. Verse 5, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Both translations say trimmed their their lamps. That's very important. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough oil for, for, for all of us. Go to a shop and buy for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. Terrible words to have to hear. He says, so you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of his return. Okay, are we good with that? Okay, can we talk about this a minute? So the King James talk, talks about, now Jesus' message was not necessarily salvation. His message was the kingdom of heaven. He says many times right here in these passages, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. This was his message. And he says here, in, in the first, first couple of verses, he said there were, he gives us this picture. He saw probably pro- prophetically, and he saw it and he said there were 10 Bridesmaids. Most translations say ten virgins. And I want you to realize that the, this is a picture of the current church. And he gives a terrible statistic of 50-50. He says of these ten virgins, and the reason I know this is the church is because the virgins represents purity and righteousness and the people who are trying to be unlike the world. So he's speaking to the church, and what he's telling the church here is, church, we have to have 100% prepared, not 50%. See, when he teaches this, he says five of them are wise and five are foolish. Now, let me, let, me, let me state this. Let me define this for you. 
You may be a very wise person, but sometimes you might make a foolish mistake. He says that there, during a time of the, the, these ladies, these ten virgins, when, he, when he's talking about them, he didn't call them ten wise women and ten fools. He said five women were wise and five of them made some very foolish mistakes. Now, I want you to know that in your Christian walk, we are bound to make some kind of mistakes. That's why every time I preach, I always talk about forgiveness and repentance. Get back as soon as you can. You ain't got time to wait. Don't dwell on your failure. Get up, dust yourself off, and move on. Amen? Okay, I'm stopping I'm I'm stop that right now. He says five. He said five are wise. Say wise. So let me tell you the definition of, of wise, okay? Wise means having or showing experience knowledge and good judgment you won't get that without the word and he says five were foolish it means lacking good sense and lacking good judgment amen he defines these the the, the women these women who are he's i say it could be 10 virgin guys i don't know okay it's women okay <laughs> Because he just said there were nine foolish virgins and one wise, okay? Now, he gives a pretty good statistic talking about these virgins. But there are people who are striving to be pure. He says five of them were foolish, five were wise. The five who were foolish, now here's how he defined the foolish and the wise. He said the foolish were defined by not having enough oil for the duration of time they needed to wait. Let me show you a picture. Can y'all pull that picture of the lamp up for me? This is probably what the lamp looked like, okay? It's probably, probably a pretty good uh, facsimile of it. And you notice, number one thing I notice, it's made of clay. Y'all, we are, we are earthen vessels. We're, we're made of dirt and clay and put formed together. But you know what? It's not how we're made. It's what we hold. And, you know, we, we, we're fragile. These clay things were fragile. They took very good care of them. It's something, something you drop and pick back up. This is something you drop and you're going to have to get another one, okay? That's how fragile they were. But you see, this is a very simple operation. You pour the oil in the top and you see the reservoir. That's the biggest space. And then you see the, the flame. And let me just say, explain to you what is between the flame and the, and the oil is, is what we would call a, we call a wick because that's in a candle. But in, the, in this lamp, it's called a mantle. How many of you had, uh, grew up with an oil lamp in your house? Anybody? Grandma, Grandpa had one as well. Yeah, we, we had those. You know, because I tell you what, as, as, as good as I like the flashlight, when you go to that battery when the power goes out and you go, I know with the flashlight drawer, and you go get the flashlight and that, the batteries are dead, that, what do you do? You go to the oil lamp. And this thing, this thing, the oil lasted a long time. Not forever, but it lasted a long time. Now, here's the thing. The, 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 the wick, I'm going to call it a wick instead of a mantle, goes from the outside is set an inch or so above the outside and it runs through, the, through, through this little hole here and goes into and sits in the oil. And what happens is the oil is absorbed in this piece of cloth and it goes to the end. And the reason it's olive oil is because olive oil is slow burning. Now let's think a minute before we go on. Let's go back to Leviticus 24. and What, did, what was the rule he said? You bring the oil. He said, you bring the oil. But did he say bring oil made of, 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 of corn? No. Almonds? No. He said, bring olive oil. But you, if you get your own olives and you have to press it. And what's left over is what God uses. See, what God is saying here too, whatever you got right now, God says, if, if you'll put it through the, the, look, I know a lot of you. A lot of you may not have felt the press some of the others have felt. Because you, you had more to get out of you before God could really use you. Not before he could save you, before he could use you. And, and there's a lot of times you feel that pressing of God. God, why do I feel this pressing? I don't feel like it's the devil. I feel like, God, why are you picking on me? He's trying to get something out of you that he can use. But to get it out, there's going to take a little pressing. 
I'm not talking about no sickness and disease. I'm talking about a little pressure on you to, to let go of some of the things that you've been holding on to. Some of the things, you, you can't take your past life and bring it into your new Christian experience. That ain't going to burn as long as olive oil will. You can't take your hurts and failures and say, God, I'll offer this as an oil for burning. No, it won't burn like olive oil will. He didn't say bring your own idea of an oil. And he said bring in, what did we say the oil was? It's a, it's a Christian experience and, and a move of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy, look, you think a move of the Holy Ghost is revival. It's not. It's when, God's, when the Holy Ghost tells you, hey, you, you, you need to stop talking to that person. You need to stop watching that certain thing. We're going to get to that in a minute, okay? It's going to make more, more sense in a minute. So the, the, the wick would go in and the olive oil would go in. But the wise, the, the foolish were, were called foolish because they didn't take enough oil to last as long as it took for the, the Lord to return. And I want to tell you that to, I'll skip to the end. Sunday's oil won't keep burning until Tuesday. What you're getting today is an oil, enough oil to put in the canister. Yeah, that's right. But come Tuesday, you better find some more oil. Sunday's oil will burn through Sunday night and Monday. But come Tuesday, you got to have some, some oil to put in there yourself. This means that, 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 that my study today I'm presenting to you, that it might be, a little bit might fit in that canister, but you, you better find out for yourself. Go home and read some word. Go home and listen to a podcast. Go home and read your Bible. Go, go, because that's what fills the, the, the reservoir. And they were defined as foolish because they, they, they got some Sunday oil that wouldn't last them the rest of their life. You think, well, man, I can't wait till next Sunday. You, you might want to go have a service at home tomorrow night. You might want to find you a podcast or something. You might want to get you a, an old, how many of you have been around long enough to have preaching on cassette tapes? Anybody still got cassette tapes? Hallelujah. You come up and say, Lord, I'm going to put my pain in here. Oh, that ain't going to burn. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put, put that message I heard two years ago, that one that, that I really liked. I'm going to put it in there. That oil has, has, has lost its ability to, to burn. You got to have some fresh oil for this fire. Because, see, what you put in, see, this is what we want. This is what we want. But we won't have this unless we put something in there. And so I'm telling you this. Let me, let me just tell you the three things that define the foolish. Number one, they didn't take enough oil. Number two, in verse 9, they asked the wise girls. They said, hey, give us some of your oil. And what made them wise is when they said no. Because you can't live off somebody else's experience. You can come in here today and you can get oil from me. We're teaching the Word of God. But you can't say, God, fill me up with the same thing you filled them up with. No, you need a Holy Ghost experience of your own. You, you, need, to have, you need to have an encounter on your own. You need to go sit down and say, God, show me something. God, speak to me. And as he does, you're going to fill that canister up. And you got extra that you're ready to pour in. Because every day of your life, you're not waiting to Sunday to have a move of God. You having one sitting at home on, on a Monday morning listening to a little worship as you're reading the word. Well, nobody's shouting in this room. Yeah, but you are alone with the Holy Ghost producing the oil that fills this lamp. And he goes on and says this. He's, he's so, let me tell you the three things. Number one, they didn't take enough oil. Number two, they, they tried to live off somebody else's experience. And number three, they left to go somewhere else to get it. And this goes back to what Amy had said earlier. Some, sometimes people, they, they get out of church going looking for that old experience, realizing that, that, that the, the lamp has gone out and the, the canister has dried up. And when you come back, you think you're going to pick up where you left off. No, 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 you've got to get in the presence of the Holy Ghost. And the, but I'm telling you, the minute you say, Lord, I am back, he starts pouring in the oil. 
He wants this thing burning. The thing we read in Leviticus 24, you bring the oil. He said it is a, it is a, a mandate that this thing burns 24 hours a day. And, and remember in Leviticus 24, let me, let me just jump ahead again. Let me just jump ahead again. It was not in the same room with the presence of God. It was on the other side of the veil. What does that mean? That says that I don't get my light. I, my light is not for God. My light is for everybody else. Why is my light burning? So people in darkness can see that I made it through. I'm going to be a light in somebody's life. I'm not going to be, I'm not just going to turn this light on when I get in the presence of God. I get in the presence of God to get it brighter, but I'm going back out. And I'm going to show people that there's a light burning inside of me. Hey, look, I know the way because I got Psalms 19, 105, a light unto my feet and a lamp to my path. You, you might be in darkness. I know where I'm going. Follow me. We're going this direction. Three things that define the wise. They took extra oil. They said no to giving theirs away. Our human experience is, oh, well, let me, just, let me just share a little bit with you. I love this as example. If you're on an airplane and you saw the video and it says if, if cabin pressure changes and these masks fall from the sky, who do you put the mask on first? Oh, no, you think, oh, i got to put it on my child first. No, no, no. You put it on you first. Because if you're not having a supply coming to you, you won't have enough to help somebody else. Now, Savannah was here last service, and she works for Delta. She's a flight attendant on uh, works with Delta. And she says, if, that, if those things fall, you have 30 seconds to get it on you. At, at the end of 30 seconds, there will not be enough room, not enough air for you to breathe anymore. And she said that she says, on a row that seats three people, four cups fall. Four cups fall. Because any time a flight attendant is walking down an aisle or someone is walking down an aisle, that fourth one is for somebody who's in the aisle. May not be in their seat, may not be in that place to get it, but you, there's four. There's one for everybody in that seat and somebody standing in the aisle. Look, God is supplying things for us to live. Amen? He says the thing that makes us wise, they took extra oil, they said no to giving away what they had. And number three, I told you all that stuff today. I took you talking about the word. I took you talking about, about the lampstand and all the oil. I took you just to, to get you this one verse. Let's go to look at Matthew 25. I'm going to change chapters here. I mean, change um, translations. I'm going to do the, uh, I'm going to look in New King James. I've been reading out New Living. I'm going to do New King James. And here's the thing. At midnight, they all heard the voice. And the Bible says, now here's the thing. I told you, read the Bible for information. Then you get revelation. Then you become a doer of the word. Here's the fourth thing. Here's the fourth thing. And I am 54 years old. I've been doing this for 34 years as a Christian, 28, as a pastor in this church, and I just saw this for the first time. The, they had their lamps. They had the oil in the lamps. The wise ones had extra, but in verse 7, look at what it says. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. I've never seen this before. Never seen this before. So I've been reading for information for Revelation, doing the word. I got a fourth thing I got to add to my Christian walk that helps me put the, keep the oil and keep in me and keep the fire burning. He says, trim the lamps. And I thought, what is this? So I looked this up and I was like, part of making this burn is the oil going in and the, of course, the, the wick or the mantle coming out. But the thing is, to make this burn you have to trim off the old part of the wick. You got the oil. We've been pouring oil in for years. We got the Holy Ghost bringing a fire into, the, into our lives and into the church. But we wonder why we keep stumbling as Christians is because we've had all this word coming in, all this revelation. We've been doing the word, but there's been something. Haven't you noticed? Something in our Christian experience didn't fit. I didn't feel like my light was burning like it, like it needed to be. 
I felt, okay, I'm pouring in enough word. I'm praying in tongues. I'm doing all these Christian things. But what is missing? Trimming the wick. See, we can pour things into our life. We pour all these Christian things into our life. But God is telling us there's some things that need to be cut out of our life. This is why I'm going to be transparent with you. And this is why I feel, you, you probably feel my passion in this. It, probably almost a month ago, as I was sitting one night reading this, actually it was one afternoon I was reading this, and, and maybe, maybe y'all like me, I, I sometimes get a little distracted, pretty easy. You know, I can sit, I love to read, I love to study, but sometimes I get distracted. Have you ever been reading your Bible and think, oh, I'll check Instagram? <laughs> Any, come on, let's see the hands. In the Word, and then you're like, oh, I got to get on Instagram. I got to make sure I ain't missing something. <laughs> Let me see those hands again. They doubled from the first time I asked. Okay. <laughs> I'm going for triple. Let's see the hands one more time. Okay. You know, I, I got to find more of my friends doing. What's socially popular? What? And, and it, that was in the middle of reading the Word. I, I, I do that. I did that. And, and I want to tell you what I'm about to tell you I don't want you to do. I only want you to do it if the Holy Ghost tells you to do this or something like it. I only follow my example in, in the fact that I listen to what God told me to cut out of my life. Don't cut out what I'm telling you to cut out. If the Holy Ghost deals with you to cut it out, you need to cut it out ASAP. As soon as possible. Because it may be what God's telling you to cut out may be different from what God's t- told me to cut out. See, my, my wick is my responsibility. Yours is your responsibility. I don't want you coming over here trimming my wick. You can go trim your own wick. Leave my wick alone. Quit being wicked. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know where else to go with that. Okay. But here's the thing. I was sitting there reading the Word, studying the Word, praying, Lord, show me. Don't, revelation, I need. And I was like, I got to check Instagram. And God said, that has become... A, a distraction to you. And he said, I want you to cut that out of your life. And all 30 of my followers are f- disappointed, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. All five of the people I was following, I'm sure they missed me. That was a little bit more than that. But anyway, I went and I, I cut that out of my life. I was very proud of myself. I went back to reading the word. I have cut out a distraction. Look how bright my light is now going to be. And God said, wait a minute. Uh, let's go to TikTok. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. And uh, I cut out TikTok. I feel like, yes, Lord, trimming. And so I remember the Lord telling me why I had to cut those out. It wasn't because they were a distraction. I'll tell you why. Because there were too many half-dressed, bouncy things trying to get my attention. <laughs> don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, only have, I only have preachers on my Instagram. Okay, come on, cut it out. <laughs> I ain't going looking for none of that, but as it pops up. You know what I'm talking about. Things are bouncing and bobbing and weaving and trying to catch your eye. But let, let me tell you something. I, I said, Lord, I said, Lord, I don't feel like I stop and stare at this stuff. He said, you're not cutting it out because of lust. You're cutting it out because you have made it acceptable in your life. You have become desensitized to what I'm calling sin. You are passing by those young ladies half-dressed trying to get attention. And you've got the mindset that it's okay now. That's just what they do. See, when you're driving, you can get in one ditch as quick as you can get in the other. We find ourselves driving in our lane and all of a sudden we get into this, we get into this, oh, lust ditch. But we try to correct, but we overcorrect and we go to the other side of the road and get in that other ditch where we become desensitized. 
And this is why God had me cut this, this thing out. Because I was allowing what he was calling sin to become socially acceptable in my own eyes. You get it? And so I was very, very happy that I was hearing the Lord, cutting out Instagram, and then cutting out TikTok. About 30 minutes later, put my Bible aside, going to catch up on some sports. God said, while we're on this, uh, <laughs> I had Hulu, I had Hulu, y'all, y'all, don't tell me if you have Hulu, I might come to your house. Uh, <laughs> I just want to catch up on some golf and, you know, see, see if there was a game on that was, that was worth watching. And, uh, and, and, you know, just see what's on there. And, uh, and God said, uh, by the way, uh, <laughs> this takes up a lot of the time I, I want to speak to you, so cut it as well. I was like, Lord, or what, anything else? I've given you Instagram. I've given you TikTok. Now you want Hulu? Come on. No, it wasn't that. I did think it. I was <laughs> be honest with you. Like, what else are you taking? Breakfast food? Come on. <laughs> what are you taking? You going to take bacon? Okay, you might as well tell me now. <laughs> and I went to Hulu. I had, to, I had no. It wasn't good enough. You can't. You can't get rid of it on your TV. You got to go get your computer out, and you got to go online to their website, and then you got to discontinue it. I went through all that stuff, and and you know what? I. I I will tell you that there are times in the day I was like, or even the night, like, oh, yeah, I want to go watch. Oh, never mind. What can I do with this time? Yeah, sometimes I pick up my Bible. Sometimes I just pray for Hulu to come back. (laughs) Restoring to me the joy of my salvation, Lord. (laughs) No, I, I know, I'm joking with that. But there, here's, here's, here's that, that, that thing that I felt like I was missing. And, you know, he didn't say, make these drastic cuts, a trim. You, you know the phrase you use when you're trying to lose weight? I'm trying to trim down. Just take a little bit off the sides, the front, and the back. <laughs> the hips, the shoulders, uh, the, the, the chin, the cheeks, uh, the throat. <laughs> just, just a little trim. You know, you know what you say when you're trying to get your budget right? We're trying to trim the budget. We're trying to get everything back in its right working order. And that's all God's doing. Look, I, I felt like I had plenty of oil. I've been reading the Word, getting revelation from the Word. I've been praying over the Word. I, I've been doing the Word. But I felt like the flame just sitting where it needs to be. And then when he said, oh, yeah, just trim a little. And y'all, I did not realize it was one o'clock. I better trim some time off my clock. <laughs> y'all stand up. Come on. Wow. Why didn't y'all tell me it was one o'clock? Oh my gosh. Praise and worship must have gone for an hour and a half. <laughs> I have to trim some time off worship. Just kidding. Y'all okay? Y'all still love me? Oh my gosh. You sped that clock up, didn't you, Patrick? Oh, my gosh, y'all, I, am, I apologize. Wow, y'all might have something burning in the crock pot. Come on, let's, let's pray. Will you play for us, please? Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I just, wow. I just feel like some things were just handled, though. I really do. As, as much of a, as I made light of a few things there's some really really big things taking place in the spirit because we've been crying out for things that we felt we deserved but God wants us to work in compliance with him not trying to earn brownie points Lord you see how much word I read last week yeah but I wanted to have some time with you to talk about what to trim off because see as important as to what you put in is as important what he asks you to do with it. He wants us to be obedient, obedient to his word. When he told me to cut those things out of my life, I didn't feel like I was offering him a sacrifice as much, off, 
pleasing him with a sacrifice as much as I was just pleasing him with, with obedience. Some of the things we think we're sacrificing we didn't need in the first place. What's he looking for? He's looking for, he might be looking for a sacrifice somewhere. But the thing he's working, looking for the most is obedience. I just want you to lift your hands right now. I feel it's a very powerful time right now. Very powerful, very po- powerful moment right now in the spirit. And I want you to utter these words to yourself very low, but I want you to speak them out of your mouth. I want you to say these words. God, do you want to trim something out of my life? And I will take about 15 or 20 seconds for you just to listen. feel to tell you this, that God may not want to speak to you in those 15 seconds, but there will be a time probably today or sometime this week where the Holy Ghost, if you'll just pull yourself away and say, God, remember Sunday when I said, do I need anything trimmed out of my life? I I don't feel like the flame is where it needs to be. I don't feel like my flame is reaching past even my own family right now. Father, I want to be a burning bright light. I want to be that city set on a hill that cannot be hid. I want to be that light that, that Leviticus says needs to burn 24 hours a day. I want to be that person that continues pr- pouring in the oil, having my, my experience with the Holy Ghost and in the Word of God and with church and just having this Holy Ghost, this just, just, just time of pressing things in my life into what something that can be burned, something of value. Father, I don't offer you my my garbage. I offer you my olive oil. Father, I just speak right now over every man and woman in this room. And fathers, we have heard a lot of word today. We've got a lot of things rolling around in our spirit right now. I just ask you, Father, to deal with us in the love of and the nurture that you deal with us in. Father, sometimes we get corrected and we didn't even feel the pain of correction. We felt the compassion to change. I'm gonna get, I just want to give this invitation. I, don't, I feel like I can't close the service without this. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, you feel like maybe, well, I did that and I feel like well, I just need to make a new commitment to him. I don't care if it's your first time praying this prayer or you making a recommitting your life to him I just want you to shoot your hand straight up if you want me to pray over you to receive Jesus or to receive him anew in your life there is a conviction rolling through this house not an ugly condemnation a true Holy Ghost conviction rolling through this house right now lift those hands one more time let me see thank you thank you thank you thank you put those hands right back down I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want the church to pray along with us who raised our hands. I want everybody in this room to pray this prayer together. Just say, say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse my heart. Make me white as snow. I thank you that your word says in Psalms 103 that you redeem my life from destruction. I thank you that today I am blood-bought by the Lamb of God and I receive forgiveness and salvation in the name of Jesus come live in my heart be my Lord my Savior and my very best friend I thank you that today is a new day for me and I refuse to take outside the pain and the hurt and the bad memories and the bad mindsets, the bad lifestyles. I refuse to take those out this door. I'll leave them where they are. And when I walk out, I walk out changed and brand new and in the middle of my transformation. Make me like you. And what I see, what I say, how I love, how I live, 
in Jesus' name. Now I just want you to receive this blessing. Father, I pray the blessing of Deuteronomy 28 over them. They're blessing the city, the field, the store, and they're going out and they're coming in. You made them the head and not the tail, Father. And at this moment, they will never come behind in any good thing. I declare right now that, Father, their bodies are healed. Their minds are restored. Their relationships are being renewed right now. Father, being put back together with the love of God, which is the bond of perfection. And, Father, I thank you right now that, Lord, whatever they do today, Father, they'll do in honor of you. Father, speak to us. Lead us and guide us. And, Father, help us to always follow you, knowing that where you go, where you lead us, is the best place for us to go. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. Y'all give God a hand this morning. If you need prayer for anything, I'll be down here after service. If you're new, we want to say hello. Other than that, you're dismissed. And we will see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock at Central Campus. Have an awesome, awesome day.